Thanks very much, and it's uh, great to uh, speak at uh, this ARM conference. So uh, we're a public company, so i just draw your attention to uh, uh, forward-looking statements. So uh, Oxford Biomedica, for those who, uh, of you who don't know us, is a 20-year-old uh, gene therapy company, 350 people uh, listed on the London Stock Exchange, um, uh, located in Oxford, just about an hour from Heathrow. So for 20 years, we've been working on lentiviral vectors and have developed what we believe is the industry-leading uh, lenti platform uh, called LentiVector, which is now uh, embedded in the first uh, gene therapy launched in the US, uh, which is Kim Raya. Um, and we formed a number of partnerships with uh, companies, clearly Novartis in the CAR-T field, uh, more recently with BioVerative in the field of uh, haemophilia, uh, but also another key partnership with Orchard Therapeutics in the gene-modified stem cell field. Uh, we've previously licensed products to uh, Sanofi, which I'll, I'll touch on. Uh, but I think one of the other key differentiators uh, with Oxford Biomedica, as we were just hearing in the previous panel, is we're the world's first uh, commercial manufacturer for lentiviral vectors, uh, thanks to the work we've been doing with, with Kim Raya. Uh, so we've been through the FDA audit, not for clinical trial supply, but for commercial supply, uh, and also with MHRA. So we, we think we have uh, industry-leading capabilities uh, on the CMC side. So the uh, company strategy is to leverage uh, the LentiVector platform uh, in two main ways. Uh, we own our vectors. Uh, we have a lot of granted patents and patent applications around uh, third generation uh, minimal lentiviral vectors with all safety features. Uh, but we also have a lot of know-how around uh, industry leading uh, manufacturing uh, capabilities. Uh, along with the facilities and quality. We've been hearing about quality for AAV. It's just as important for lentiviral vectors, certainly going uh, commercial. So on the left, you see we work with partners. If they're originating a program um, who need a safe pair of hands for uh, late uh, clinical and indeed commercial supply of a vector uh, with the partnership shown at the bottom, uh, where we sign uh, royalty-bearing licenses uh, in the field that's required. But we also develop our own products, uh, focusing on in vivo use of lentiviral vectors, where we were the, were the world's first to administer lenti uh, to, to man for, for gene therapy in 2008 for our Parkinson's program, which I'll touch on. And uh, historically, we've uh, partnered uh, ocular programs with Sanofi, for inherited retinal diseases where the genes are way too big for AAV, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll touch on, on that. So we have a dual business model, helping others, de-risking others, accelerating them uh, to BLA and beyond, as well as developing our own proprietary product. So you can see quite a, a busy pipeline slide. Um, uh, the bottom piece is uh, where we work with others. So in blue, you can see Novartis programs, CTL019, or Tisagen Lec Lucel is the old name for Kim Raya. Uh, we work on a second uh, solid tumor CAR T. Uh, we have a key relationship with Orchard Therapeutics, working in ADA SCID and uh, MPS 3A. Um, and at the bottom, Haemophilia A and B programs uh, with BioVerative. Uh, I, I think this uh, was a very important deal for us um, in uh, February. It's a $100 million licensing deal and really shows commitment from another major company uh, using lentiviral vectors injected intravenously to target the liver. Our own programs, a lead program is uh, for Parkinson's disease. I'll show you one slide on that. But we have a corneal graft rejection program in uh, late preclinical and our own solid tumor CAR-T product targeting a protein called 5T4. That's 302. And the two programs partnered with uh, Sanofi, uh, which are in phase two. For, for very important inherited retinal diseases. So our lead program is OXB102 for, for gene therapy for Parkinson's. Standard of care, as everyone uh, is probably aware, is oral L-DOPA medication, where a small amount of remaining substantia nigra converts L-DOPA to dopamine. But this uh, gives pulsatile uh, availability of dopamine. There are some AAV2 approaches, uh, more than one in the field, and uh, that's focused on uh, uh, generating more AADC enzyme in the putamen to do better conversion of L-DOPA to dopamine. We've taken a really different approach. Uh, we've, because uh, lentiviral vectors can deliver double the capacity 
of genes of AAV, uh, we've put in three enzymes to allow uh, conversion of tyrosine to dopamine in a, in a steady state uh, tonic uh, provision of dopamine. But we can still add in uh, standard of care medication for some fine control. So we think this is a stabilizing, more tonic uh, delivery of dopamine. We've already dosed 15 patients um, in the first gen product, 12 in Paris, France, and three in Cambridge, the real Cambridge, that is in uh, uh, UK. And uh, I, I had to get that one in. And we're looking forward to uh, the next study with this second gen uh, program starting in a couple of months. So unusually uh, for a gene therapy company, we're also pretty financially driven. We have pretty uh, rapid growth, uh, income growth up nearly 30% in 2017 over 2016, a mixture of uh, licensing revenue, uh, but also uh, uh, manufacturing process development revenue in light blue. And uh, 2017 saw us just about breaking even in terms of EBITR. So as we look ahead uh, for this year, uh, we've got a, a number of uh, catalysts. Uh, Novartis um, are expecting to put a second CAR-T program into the clinic that we're working on. We get a, a single-digit royalty on net sales for Kim Raya, so we look forward to more royalty reports uh, from Novartis. Uh, but they're also looking for label expansion to DLBCL and uh, uh, also launching in Europe for both ALL and uh, DLBCL. Uh, we're working very hard with Orchard Therapeutics to support their first BLA uh, for a Lenti stem cell product and uh, getting the bioverative programs going and progressing is, is very important. Uh, because we have a platform, we can sign some more uh, deals uh, to help others and we look to, uh, to, to see some more of those. And we're expanding our facilities uh, uh, to more than double uh, up in, in capacity because there is a shortage not only of quantity but crucially quality in, in the uh, gene therapy uh, sector generally. And we look to uh, partner or um, uh, out-license or potentially spin off um, our in-house products. So thanks very much. Thanks, Jason. Um, I'll, I'll start uh, by asking about Kim Raya. Obviously, that's a landmark event as the first gene therapy approved in the US. Could you talk a bit more about how your Lenti vector technology specifically enabled progress for Novartis, your partner? So I think most people uh, consider that lentiviral vectors are pretty much synonymous with T cell products or stem cell products where clearly the products divide and you need the transgenes to be carried through to the daughter cells. So that's clearly the situation with CAR T products, TCRT products, and, and gene modified stem cell products. Um, the area where we think uh, there's a bit of under recognition in the field is that a lot of gene therapy challenges have target organs that are slowly turning over or rapidly turning over, where other vector systems like AAV will get diluted out. So if you really want to treat uh, pediatric patients uh, with growing organs, if you want a one-time administration, you really do want a vector system that integrates. And, and that's where we think uh, lentiviral vectors have, have a, a lot to offer. Right, so uh, you've mentioned a couple advantages relative to AV, it's transgene capacity and uh, differences in integration. Uh, where else might lentiviral vectors uh, excel relative to AV? So we are huge fans of AV, uh, AV uh, and Lenti. Uh, you know, it, it's not a matter of uh, religion or, or soccer club uh, or baseball club. We think they're different tools for, for different settings. Um, we, we don't have to pre-screen patients for pre-existing immunity with lentiviral vectors. And now that we've uh, cracked the manufacturing challenges, historically people thought that Lenti was difficult to make and AAV was hard people now realize that AAV is still hard and Lenti has, has got a lot easier. Um, and I think uh, our, our key process innovation there has been to allow a 200 liter serum-free suspension uh, bioreactor process uh, to, to be transitioned into our GMP facilities well over a year ago. So we have multiple products being released and this process is not only uh, more efficient from how you use your facilities uh, in the programs we've tested, there's a per liter productivity increase um, over our competitors of around tenfold. So being able to reduce vector cost of goods 
by tenfold is, is really significant for us all. So just to follow on, is there, uh, in the future, will there be logic to companies utilizing both vectors in-house, lentiviral and AAV, or is there so much of a loss on manufacturing efficiency that it, it may not make sense? I think Big Pharma are used to uh, being able to make monoclonal antibodies, recombinant proteins, small molecules. So, uh, you know, um, we, we know some Big Pharma who, who are using both. Uh, so it's horses for courses. I, I don't know if that translates into American English. Um, but, you know, we, we would say that uh, uh, you should look at the target product profile and uh, the vector system uh, is, is maybe not the most important. It's the efficacy of the product that you think is going to bring uh, long-term patient benefit. Sure. And then on to manufacturing, which we've heard a lot about in recent times. Um, I was struck by a, a CMO who actually, when I asked about uh, who's good uh, globally, um, Oxford was the one non-CMO that was mentioned specifically. Um, so could you talk about uh, what differentiates you, what your capacity is, um, and, and how you plan to use it going forward? Well, it's nice of them to say that. Um, we've, we've been developing these vectors for 20 years. Um, we've been developing manufacturing to support our own product development. So, you know, we, we understand the technology soup to nuts. Uh, a lot of our employees have been with us for 20 years. So I, I think, you know, we're, we're a heritage company that has matured around the same time as, as the sector. Uh, so, you know, we understand CMC reg challenges. We can help support... Um, companies when they're writing their BLA submissions. Uh, so the help that we provide goes beyond just process transfer. We'd prefer people to use our process. And if they want to uh, leverage experience that we've had in the product development arena, then that might come for free. So it, it's more of an integrated partnership model. Uh, we don't work with a large number of clients, but we will be expanding. Um, so given the fact that we're moving from an adherent manufacturing technology to a serum-free suspension uh, bioreactor process, uh, we recently raised 20 million pounds to uh, build a, a new manufacturing headquarters in, in Oxford, UK, to bring on four new vector uh, manufacturing suites with fill finish. Um, and we think that this will help us to grow with our current collaborations and also sign up some new folk. Uh, but as, as any uh, you know, safe pair of hands in the industry could say at the moment, and, and some of our peers are in, in the audience here, everyone is very busy, uh, so are we, but we're expanding to bring a lot of new capacity on towards the end of, uh, of next year. And is it true that there uh, will be a capacity bottleneck uh, in the vector gene therapy industry in 2019? Uh, well, I, I think there is in 2018, um, but we're expanding and some of our peers are expanding. Uh, the, the, uh, the challenge is, is always uh, to maintain quality and to be able to match what quality your clients want, whether it's first-in-man, suitable for first-in-man trials, versus process characterization and process validation, which are huge uh, work packages you have to do to support uh, the, the challenges of making BLA submissions. And could you talk a little bit about um, whether you have more capacity to partner um, and what you look for when you consider partners for that capacity? Well, I think we've been uh, exceptionally grateful uh, with our colleagues at Novartis for, for the partnership there. We've been working uh, very closely since 2014 to, to help uh, them uh, translate uh, CAR-Ts um, uh, uh, towards the market. Uh, because we have a royalty entitlement, we try to select partners who, who we really believe are going to have products that are launched. And in some instances, we've taken stock instead of, of cash uh, for, for licenses. And, uh, you know, we, uh, we want to diversify our client pool uh, so that we don't just work in the CAR-T field. Uh, Bioverative in, in hemophilia was another a key partnership for us. And then very quickly, the last one, uh, what's your strategy on internal proprietary products versus partnering? So we think there's a very interesting business model where you can develop uh, gene therapy programs to uh, phase one ready status 
and then look for partnerships. So uh, we have uh, partnering discussions ongoing for a number of our uh, programs, including the Parkinson's program, and we're also considering spinning off the ocular assets into a new co. So hopefully later on in the year, we'll, we'll have an update on our own uh, proprietary product pipeline. Great. Thank you very much to Dr. Jason Slingsby. Thanks.